I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Florida. Our work as therapists is really to help people learn how to feel bad, to build a distress tolerance so that they can deal with what the worst of life has to offer so that then they're available for, for the best. There's sensations that we have in our body that you know, then we identify as and, and name and categorize as emotions, which is helpful to be able to work with them. But really they're sensations in our body that everybody experiences differently. When it comes in, in the wave of grief comes or, or pain or sadness or whatever or guilt comes up, be with it. Don't try to avoid it. Don't try to get off of it. They always say when you're in a strong riptide to let it take you where it's got to go and it's going to take you to shore. And I think if you allow yourself to go through it, you allow yourself to release it in a way, even though you're in it, it's going to take you back where you need to be. Ryan Suave, or not so suave as you said your, your friends call you, <laughs> which is hilarious. Uh, I want to thank you for being here again. And I'm excited about our conversation. I've heard a uh, friend, Alex, for those of you listening, uh, introduced us to has some incredible things to say about you. And off the mic, the conversation's already been great. So I can tell you're uh, going to be a, quite the gentleman to speak to. And just start so my audience could get to know a little bit about you. And uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks for um, having me. And thanks to, for, to Alex for lying a little bit about <laughs> me to, to say some nice things. That was, that was really nice of him. Um, uh, grateful to be here. Um, I, uh, my training and practices as a, as a therapist, I'm a licensed mental health counselor in, in Florida. Um, I've spent the better part of the last decade and a half. Um, it was kind of a second career for me. I came through it through my own mental health and healing and, and went back to school and, and became a therapist. But, um, I've, I've spent most of that time working with people with, um, all a host of mental health challenges, but really focused on, uh, trauma, uh, grief and addictions. Um, and so I've, you know, been, and, and also worked as a coach and kind of in some personal development type trainings. Um, I, I also serve as the, the chief clinical officer of, uh, a large set of behavioral health facilities. Um, that's a, a national company called guardian recovery network. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of constantly dealing with, uh, a lot of what we're talking about here from on a, on a professional level. Um, or what you talk about in your podcast. And, you know, also I've had some personal experience. I hear that and I appreciate that. And I do want to question in regards to the work that you do. I feel like when the word therapy gets thrown around and uh, and the professional aspect of it, there's, I feel like people can go to the same school and then come out with different modalities and different perspectives on how to handle clientele and trauma, et cetera. And one of the words that I remember reading on your website was holistic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what, what does that mean? I mean, I know what that means, but how would you describe your methods or your perspective on how you treat your clients? Yeah, I, I think holistic is a great word to put on a website, right? Because that's what every, everyone kind of wants to look for a holistic approach, but maybe doesn't always know what it is. And I think it, it, it probably is different for different, you know, people and different practitioners. Um, you know, I, it, I, I kind of approach it from it's, it's like looking at the whole person. And, you know, that that might be a nice term to use as well. But what is what do we mean when we're saying we're looking at the the whole person. And that means, you know, they might be coming to, to me or another practitioner for help with say depression. Um, and they have the symptoms of depression that are going on and we maybe can identify that. Um, it's, it's not, you know, I, it, it's not always best practice to just identify the depression and, and treat it, whether you're suggesting they go for psychiatric evaluation, which you may do, um, and go to medication and that's, that's all they do, right? We want to look at what's going on in their, in their lives. You know, what are their, what's going on with them medically and physically? You know, I mean, someone who's dealing with depression, you know, might be somebody that's also has diabetes that out of, that's out of control and, uh, or very overweight. And those are things that can lead to symptoms of depression. That doesn't mean they don't have depression, but, you know, looking at it more in a way of, of, of seeing what's going on for them, you know, in, in that way, physically, what's going on with them you know, in their, in the system or ecosystem that they belong to their family system, their, their work, you know, are they, are they happy with their job? Are they happy with their place in life? Have they suffered losses? All of these things could lead to, you know, feelings of depression. And again, that doesn't mean that they don't have a, a depression that could be medicated or, or otherwise, but we want to be able to address that, that whole person, you know, someone who's, you know, maybe working in a job that is not aligned with who they really want to be, or, you know, they're in a relationship that's doing the same thing, or they're not showing up in a way that they know that they can, you know, those are going to, those are going to have people feel, you know, those symptoms of depression or anxiety or, or whatever it is. And so 
it's not a matter of just identifying one little aspect of the person. They have a lot of, you know, people are, there might be some simple solutions for people, but, and, and people aren't that complicated generally, but they can be very complex. Just a quick example, you know, I, I had a, I had a friend in college who drove this very old Volvo station wagon. He was a, an athlete, he was big and he was pretty stubborn and, and cheap. I, I, I love him, but I'm not gonna name him, but you know, he, 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 this, Volks, this Volvo that he had, was so out of alignment that, you know, if he let go of the steering wheel, it would do basically a U-turn to the left. But he was cheap and stubborn, so he wasn't going to get it fixed. And he was strong, so when he would drive it, you know, he'd have to hold the wheel in a way that if you were driving behind him, it looked like the car was, was just fine. But it didn't matter how long he drove in a way that had the car go straight. The second he let go, he would, you know, do a U-turn to the left. And that took, you know, while that can work, it takes, you know physical strength, it takes vigilance, it takes endurance. And after a while you might just get tired. And I, I think that's a, a good analogy for, you know, what we're dealing with in life. If we're just treating the symptoms, we might not be looking like we would at the, you know, the correct thing for him to do would be take it to the tire store, check out the alignment, get that fixed. You know, and maybe if he realized it when he was 20 miles from a, a tire repair place, he has to drive like that. But eventually you've got to get the alignment, you know, taken care of. And then you can relate to that car in a different way because the way he was relating to that car was based on the symptoms that it was having. Really getting underneath all of that's going on and while maybe treating those symptoms, you know, doing some work to really understand what's driving them, you know, what in history is kind of propelling people automatically and unconsciously to fall into those those patterns. You said one thing is specifically, uh, you, you were talking about the ecosystem of people's lives. I'm reading a book, uh, what the heck's his name? Uh, Brian Weiss. Brian Weiss? Yeah, Brian Weiss. And he mentioned something about how, and it related to me because when I think about trauma or my own trauma, I think about like that one event, like, my, okay, my dad died in 9-11, that one event and fill in your own trauma, whatever it is. And I've always, not always, but I have correlated with that one big event in our life. But when it comes to the ecosystem of the way we live and in general, sometimes just those little things, the way someone talks to you when you're raised constantly every day, every night, that kind of like deep goes deep down into your subconscious. So what is the difference in regards to those little tidbits that may happen on a, a daily occurrence, whether it be the way someone speaks to you or something you've seen every day compared to one big trauma, like losing someone? Well, I think that, I mean, those are extremely impactful, especially when they happen. You know, we, we call those years our formative years for a reason, right? That's when we're forming, our brains are still forming, you know, it, it, it really, you know, depending on the research you look at until we're about 25, that might differ between, you know, men and women, but especially when we're very young, these, you know, our, 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 our brains are going through significant development and learning how to not only live, but basically survive. And then, you know, those years are when we learn how to be in relationships, you know, our, our relationships with our early caregivers are identify our first relationships with, with men, women, whether, even if they're absent, right. We, we, we learn to, deal with uh, absentee caregivers, right? Whether they meant to or they, they, they died or, you know, they, they left or were never involved. And then, you know, we learn how to, you know, we learn how to swim in the waters that we're in. And we develop these patterns to, to basically live and, and, and survive and, and hopefully thrive. But some of these patterns that we develop, especially if they're unhelpful, like kind of relationships that we're in or they're painful ones we learn how to survive in that and then if that's never really that type of trauma isn't resolved you're going to take those patterns into adulthood and then people become often fixed in the way that they relate to the world and it worked in the environment that they were in when they were kids but now they're in an environment that they're adults and and it's a it's different people they're they're able to fend for themselves or they should be able to fend for themselves and you know, they're still applying this same type of pattern to the, the, their, their new life. I mean, there's a, a psychologist, uh, Peter Levine, that says, you know, that our, our pathology is our maladaptive survival strategies. Like we needed them at a certain point, but if they become fixed and we continue to use them. So I guess going back to a car analogy, it would be like, you know, you develop a car that has to, you know, you develop like a car that needs to drive off road in a Baja race, <laughs> right? That that car is going to be very good in low gears and, you know, climbing things and in the sand, but it's not going to do very well on an F1 track or potentially in traffic. Or if you have a family with kids and you need to take them to school, 
right? So we want to be able to develop kind of these, these different gears to be able to apply, you know, the, the uh, apply the way, you know, apply them to our life as it comes to us rather than having a way that we deal with life and then applying it to all situations. So it'll work when it works because it's appropriate, but when it's not, it, it, it won't work. You know, I, I, I've dealt a lot in my career with like very successful people that are able to, um, let's say build a company, make a lot of money, make be under an extreme amount of stress and make decisions that, that continue to move them forward. They're able to like declare a vision and, and go after it and make it happen, yet they can't keep a relationship together or they're, or, uh, they're, they're, they're in constant, you know, they're, they're, their kids don't like them. And, you know, they, they, for what, however they were developed, you know, they developed, they became really good at transactional relationships and they can do them and, and really thrive in them. But if you apply that same type of transactional relationship, that's going to make you successful in business to your intimate relationship or dealing with your, you know, four month old or four year old kid, it's not going to go very well. And, you know, so we want to help those people kind of develop, not, not get rid of what's, what's helpful for them in the business world, but help them develop things that are going to make them good in these intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, another, I, I like to talk about examples. It'd be kind of like a, a football player that, you know, is, is, is a, an all pro on his way to the hall of fame. And, but all he knows is how to play football. So on Sunday he plays football for an hour, but then after the game's over, he just keeps playing football. You know, he's, he's running and sprinting everywhere he goes, he's tackling people, throwing them out of the way. I mean, eventually people are going to not want to be near him and he's probably going to be exhausted right? He, he's not going to, he needs to be able to like, oh, I'm, I'm on the field now. I'm going to employ everything that I'm great at on the field, but off the field, I need another set of strategies and another way to deal with life. And I think that's the same thing that happens with us. You know, when we, when we grow and in, in learn how to be in relationships early on, you know, they're, they're, those specific relationships are how we're learning to live. And when we look at our lifespan, you know, it, it's, it's very different because th there are things that if we are abandoned, let's say at two months old, we could die, you know, and because we can't fend for ourselves, we can't feed ourselves, we can't protect ourselves. You know, uh, uh, I have a two year old who, if we left him alone outside, he's not going to be very, it's not going to he's not going to last very long. You know, we have a almost five-year-old, if we leave her outside for a while, you know, it's going to be some time. She's going to be able to like run to the neighbors and knock on the door or open our door or, you know, whatever. And then we have a 16-year-old who's going to be able to, you know, use his phone and, 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 and find ways to get food and stuff like that. We're not, we're not doing any of these things to any of our kids, but, but, you know, I mean, and then as an adult, you know, I really can't be abandoned in that way. Like pe people can leave me and I can be hurt, but it's not dangerous to my uh, life. Like I'm not going to survive if somebody leaves me. So let's say somebody was abandoned and neglected as a child, right? And they're like, they have to scream and cry just to get fed. And that continues to happen and is never resolved later in life. They might not be thinking when somebody leaves them or a relationship isn't going well, or somebody, they feel like their needs aren't going to be bad. They might not think I'm going to die, but if we look at their reactions, they might still be screaming and yelling just to get fed. Mm -hmm you know, emotionally fed or, you know, or, or, or whatever. And, and it might develop a, a more polished way of dealing with it and they become very controlling or manipulative or codependent and, and they, they can't handle when someone's leaving because it maybe at the core of it, it feels like, it feels like death. It feels like that same thing that was happening early on. Right. And it doesn't mean that as an adult, if somebody leaves me or somebody dies, I shouldn't experience pain, but it's, I, I need to understand that it's not going to kill me. And when I can understand that it's not going to kill me, then I'm able to experience that pain. I'm able to be with that grief. I'm able to be with that loss, you know, rather than trying to avoid it. Cause the more we try to avoid it, the longer it kind of sticks. Around. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know if that answered. No, no. Question. Yeah. I think you, you answered like my, the next 12 questions I had, I think the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I this may be a scattered question, but in regards to, I don't even know if I'm using this in the right context, but those neural pathways that we might create you know, forming bad habits that it, maybe as a kid, when we go through a trauma, me, for example, when I was 12, when I lost my dad, maybe that's a little older than the developmental stage, but I guess it's still developmental. What, what is the, it's a two part question. What is the position from a parent looking at a child, their own child that maybe experienced grief or some kind of major trauma and they may be seeing those bad habits form, however you want to detect it, or, Maybe they don't. So, A, 
what is the approach from a parent that is looking at a child that just experienced something trauma to kind of keep an eye out for that? Or if they do notice it, what do they do? And then I'm curious in regards to being an adult and developing those bad habits. So I guess my first question is from a parental point of view, from a child that is experiencing loss, grief, trauma, what should they be looking for? And if they have noticed anything, what is the approach? Let me try to tackle that and I'll, I'll start and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But, you know, first off, that's still a very developmental stage at 12 years old. And I'm, I'm really sorry that that happened, right? That, that, that's, a, that's a huge impactful event and, and traumatic wound, which I'm sure you've you recognize because you have this podcast and I imagine that that's, that's kind of a, a, a I mean, I forgot my dad died. So I don't know what the hell this podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just a coincidence. Yeah, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> um, you'll never forget that. And there's an imprint and it's not just in your, in your mind, right? It's, it's kind of in your body, not kind of, it is in your body, right? We, we call them uh, feelings because we feel them. You know, there's sensations that we have in our body that, you know, then we identify as and, and name and categorize as emotions, which is helpful to be able to work with them. But really there are sensations in our body that, that everybody experiences differently. And especially the ones that we see as the negative emotions, maybe it's anger, guilt, shame, fear, you know, those are going to be uncomfortable. And, you know, I, I think my, my, something I don't put on the website, but I think my, my work as a therapist is, and, and, and our work as therapists is really to help people learn how to feel bad, you know, to build a distress tolerance so that they can deal with what the worst of life has to offer so that then they're available for, for, for the best, you know, and, and rather than just kind of feel discomfort and try to move out of it, you know, that way we're always kind of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, which is never really has us live life as it, as it is. Right. And, and, and it creates, it creates its own, its own suffering. So using that to come back to what your, your question was, I mean, people who have experienced trauma, you know, th that is going to often fall into how they, they parent, you know, we've worked with people. I've, we, I, and we have worked with people over the years that, you know, they didn't even, you know, they knew they had some trauma or they, there was some that they didn't even remember. And then when their kid became about the age of when it happened to them, they started getting really, you know, anxious around it or controlling or having their own reactions that they, they couldn't really ha that really had trouble dealing with, you know, and if you think about it, that might be like they're in uncharted territory where, you know, th this is how their life was at one point And now it, it changed at that age. And maybe they don't want that to happen to their kids. And I think that could be wrong, but I think most of us are oriented to really want to protect our children. I mean, I think it's kind of built into us. I'm not a neurobiologist, but I, I, I would imagine that that's kind of baked in there somewhere. Yeah. I mean, sorry to cut and, you off, but you put your two-year-old outside your house and let them fend for themselves. So no. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't repeat that. That is not true. That for legal true. purposes, that is a joke. Do not go after him. Okay. <laughs> the two-year-old is the easiest to deal with. right? Um, so, you know, and, and so people may have their own trauma reaction around it, right? Or people don't want their children to experience what they experienced, you know, if they had a pain, you know, pain in their childhood. And that, and then what can happen is when they see that their child is experiencing their, their reaction can be, I, I don't want them to experience it, you know, and I want to protect them from, from, from pain. And there's a point of that, which you want to protect them so that they don't, so that they're alive and that they're safe. But if we spend our lives as parents protecting our children from their pain, number one, it's going to stress us out completely as parents. And number two, they're not going to learn how to deal with pain. They're not going to know how to deal with loss and end up, even if they're very intelligent, growing up in, in a world where they, in their own lives, where they maybe have a very low emotional intelligence because that was the, the ability to experience what was, was painful or to experience lost was robbed from them. You know, and, I, and that sounds like a, a, a very harsh statement. And I think most parents would never try to do that. I mean, I, I hate seeing my, my kids in, in any sort of pain. And it, it, it takes a lot to, to not try to stop that. And I'm sure I don't succeed at it all the time. But we want to help them build their res resilience. And, I, and that doesn't mean create scenarios in which they're going to e experience pain, you know. I mean, we, we, I, I, maybe it's time to, we can talk about this. We were chatting before just talking about being on the, on your podcast and, and about death. And, 
you know, this, this summer we, you know, I have a two year old and a a four year old and a a, a 16 year old. And, um, we had this family dog, a big golden doodle. And out of nowhere, he was only five years old. Out of nowhere, he got sick. And within a week, he, he, we had to put him to sleep. And I had taken him to the vet and they were going to put him to sleep. They said, we should probably do it now. And I said, you know, I, I had just taken him to the doctor and told the kids I was going to the doctor. We didn't know what was, we knew a little bit was happening, but we didn't think that was going to happen at all. And I, I said, I got to take him home first. And, and I, I, I brought him home and I brought the kids in. You know, the two-year-old doesn't really know what's going on. He was only a year at the time, but you know, our, our 16 year old came in and he said goodbye and he understood what was going on and wasn't really happy about it. You know, he was really upset. What was really interesting to me was the four year old's response. She's a little tiny girl. And my wife and I caught ourselves just telling her, you know, he's going to go to, we're going to put him to sleep. You know, he's going to go to sleep and not wake up. And looking back at it, we were avoiding whether we knew it consciously or not. I don't think we did. We were avoiding saying death. You know, we both have our own experiences with death. You know, I, I, you know, I think I share with you a lot of the death that I've had experience in my life where people that were, you know, older that were, you know, it was kind of, I don't know whether to say appropriate or not, but it was, it was not like it was, it was a shock. Um, but it still is a shock, right? Because we, we orient towards those people. We love them. And I, I, I still remember, you know, being 10 years old and standing in outside of the bathroom where my mom was cleaning a bathtub in our in our house and I handed her the phone and she just screamed because her, her mom had died and I, I can still remember that scream right it placed an imprint on me and it was I remember everything that happened after that like it was you know five minutes ago and I'm 48 years old it was 38 years ago you know and 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 so having experiences like that and then also being a therapist and having experiences working with people who've had a, a, you know extreme trauma and, and experience lots of death and, and, and loss, I, you know, if I, if I'm honest with myself, that was prop that was in there when I was telling my daughter or we were telling our daughter that the, our dog was going to be put to sleep. And, you know, thankfully she asked this little tiny girl said, does that mean he's going to be dead? And I caught myself saying no. I, I mean, wanting to say no, I didn't say that. And I, I said, yes. And then she had this like emotional outburst. It was really like intense. And it was like everything that I didn't want her to experience. But what happened over the next bit was really cool. I mean, I wasn't thinking it was cool in the moment because it was painful, but she went through this huge response and then kind of came down on the other side of it, you know, was not in that intense emotion and then started asking questions. And, you know, some of them were, you know, she said, is is his eyes going to be dead or his nose going to be dead? And she said, is he going to be flat like a pancake? Which I, I don't know where she got. It might have been some, from some cartoon. <laughs> but, you know, you know, then she was able to ask questions and we talked about it. And I was like, oh, we can be completely honest with her. I don't have to hide anything from her. And so I took him back. We put him to sleep. And then I came back to the house and she started asking me all these questions. You know, where's, where's his name's Theo? Where's Theo? What's he going to... You know, and I, I, things that I knew I would answer and things I didn't know I'd say I don't know to. And she would continue to ask questions. And then she'd, you know, cry and say she missed him. And then, you know, I've, I've caught her going out into the backyard, we have, and, and like talking to him. Not like, you know, just like, in, in not in like a painful way. Like, oh, hey, Theo, I miss you. Where, you know, where are you? Just like yelling up into the, into the sky. And it's become this thing over the past several months where she'll come back to it and, and talking about death in a way that is just not taboo. You know, and, and to me, this fortifies the belief that I've had that, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of immortal hmm. in the way that we continue to relate to things and people well after they're gone. And, you know, this is what I've seen as a therapist. You know, I, I, I work with people who are still reacting to life in the way that, let's say, their mom or dad talk to them, whether their mom and dad are alive or have been dead for many years. Like that relationship still exists because our relationship with people is how we how I, my relationship with somebody is how I relate to them. And, you know, we will continue to, to do that. In fact, even in life, most of our relationships with people happen when they're not there. Most, I, my wife is the one I probably spend the most time with. And the, most of my relationship with my wife happened when she's not there, how I'm thinking about her, how I, you know, 
what, how I'm thinking about a relationship. If, if I have to share something that's uncomfortable, how she might respond to it. You know, I mean, and I think that's true with, with people, at least with people I work with all the time, you know, they, they, they're going to go ask their boss for a raise and they have this whole relationship with him, with the him or her before it even happens. And they're determining what's going on and, and everything like that. So I, I think that's an important aspect to see that, you know, whatever your spiritual beliefs are or religious beliefs that, that, that people live on in the way that we continue to relate to them and remember them and, and, and hold them. And, and, you know, I know I was talking about my dog, but in working with people over the years, that was, that's, that's one of the things that impacts people tremendously is a loss of a pet, right? This kind of un conditional love that they've been orienting to. And now all of a sudden that orientation is gone. Like, and it's not there. They're not in the house. And I still feel maybe like they are, mm. you know, what they've meant to you. It, it, it's the dog isn't, doesn't have a human, you know, relationship with us, but I'm having one with the dog, right? Thinking about like, uh, is this the right thing to do? You know, in putting them to sleep? Well, he's probably not thinking, he's not thinking that he's not probably contemplating his own death. But I am, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of putting like a human mind in the animal in the way that I relate to him. And I think that's what we're doing with, with, with people all the time too. Yeah. You reminded me of this. This is actually a children's book called The Invisible String. And it kind of relates to what you were saying. Like it, there's like an invisible string between us and everyone, let alone the people that we, that pass. And I feel like that invisible string is the way we talk about them, how we relate to them how we think about them, have those conversations within ourselves, whether they're alive or not. I think that is important to me, at least in the journey of kind of living with grief. And I think a lot of people, I, I've also seen responses that people don't want to talk and just want to, because they feel like they're reopening that wound and they think it's part of the process to not talk about it. Even though I think that goes back to what you were saying, which is a beautiful lesson, by the way, in regards to, I think with, a, as a childless single man, raising a child in, how to deal with pain because it, it seems like a tough conversation, which I imagine it is, but at the same time, it's, it's a balancing act between how gentle you want to be, but also understanding the reality of life and what they're going to grow into and having those hard conversations and the pattern that your daughter expressed in handling grief. I feel like that was like the quintessential free experience of grief that I've ever heard of. You know what I mean? Like that, that arc, that arc or up and down of grief that she experienced is remarkable and you mentioned pre-recording how you wish that adults and quote unquote adults would handle it like that. And I'm not saying, again, I don't want to come off the wrong way saying we should handle grief in a certain way because uh, who knows, but at the same time, that express expressional manner of doing it, of letting it out and kind of letting it happen to me is so important with anything. And I, I've briefly mentioned this in the past. Last year was a rough year for me after doing like a breakup that I had and it, it got prolonged for a while. And granted, that's not a biological death, but it's, you know, it has a lot of the mannerisms of grief. And I feel like, and I don't know, I'm not saying I did a perfect. It has the mannerisms of, mannerisms of grief. because Yes, of exactly. Yeah. I was hoping. I was and it's not only losing what you had, it's losing, you know, if it was someone that you were potentially thinking about being with for your life, you're not only losing what you had, you're losing what you didn't get. That's the crazy part about losing someone. There's so many, there's so many layers to the onion of it. It's, it's not just you lost that person out with you. You're grieving a future. You're grieving uh, a potential loss of identity because your identity is attached to the routines of life. And then when you, any routine, any change of routine is weird. You know, you, make, you move into a new house, you feel all disoriented. And I forgot where my toothbrush is or where the cabinet is. You know, it's like a, it's an adjustment period. And when you lose someone like that, it's just, for me, my biggest lesson that I, for whatever reason, felt like I did innately, or maybe it was because of my, you know, unprofessional studies and just uh, cognitive thoughts of how to handle shit in life, feeling it for me is the most important thing. And it wasn't, I, I'm not much of an escapist. You know, occasionally I like to do things and just to get out and like physically release or just, just you know, think of something different. Of course, I think that's healthy. But for me, I would just sit, like, sit in it. Like physically, literally just sit down and sit in that shit. And it took a while, but I feel like that was a big part of my process of just allowing it to feel however long it might take. So I just wonder what is that balancing act of allowing yourself to feel it, but what is a good appetizer to that? Well, I, I think that I'm not an etymologist, like I'm not understand where all words come from, but I, I think that the word grief and gravity kind of share the 
similar root word. And whether that's true or not, I think this is a, it's a, gra- I, when I think of gravity, right, gravity is what holds the planet in orbit, right? So there's a, a certain gravity that holds the planet in the orbit that it's going in. And if something, you know, disturbs that gravity, that planet's going to go into a different orbit. Now, that doesn't mean the new orbit is better or worse or dangerous or more dangerous or more safe. I think that's the same thing that happens with us in the way that we relate to people. We kind of get, it, it holds us in the gravity of how we kind of orbit our lives, right? And, and, and when there's a loss, it throws us into a, a new orbit. And that orbit, whether it's better, worse, we don't know what that is, right? Because it's, it's, it, it will, we'll learn that over time, but it's new and it's disorienting. You know, and, and it's hard to navigate your life with a, a, you know, when you're like, it would be kind of like when you're disoriented, it would be kind of like all of a sudden you, you have to navigate a compass by, you know, there's no longer magnetic north, there's magnetic east. Right? It's going to be very difficult to, to navigate. Now, once you figured it out, it's going to be the same. It might be the same way. And that's a very simple example to use. But I think that's the same thing that's happening is we, we fall into a new orbit. Mm. And oftentimes we'll be clamoring to try to find that, that old orbit. And, I, and that's where the grief process comes in. And you'll, you know, I'm sure you've talked about the stages of grief on here and, and we don't need to go into those, but the, what I've learned is they're not linear, right? It's, it's it, by any means. And, and you might be in acceptance one day and back in, you know, kind of negotiating at the next or in shock again. And it's kind of like you're crambling to, to either for the old orbit or try to figure the new one. And I think another way to look at Grief is like there's a it's, there's a grip, right? You've got something's got a grip on you, and the, the grief process is kind of loosening that grip. And so, coming to your question, like kind of finding ways to be able to settle into that new orbit. You know, I think some people don't want to get into that new orbit and feel like they should remain in the pain and the agony and the sadness because they might forget the person or forget their relationship with them if they come to acceptance. And I, I don't think that's the case. Mm-hmm. But how to deal with it is, is to, like we talked about before, is, you know, re- or part of how we talked about before is being able to recognize those difficult emotions and, and being with them, you know, kind of doing what my daughter did, but on a continual basis. Like when it, when it comes and, it, and the wave of grief comes or, or pain or sadness or whatever or guilt comes up, like be with it. Don't try to avoid it. Don't try to get off of it. You know, you might need help with that because somebody might seem overwhelming, but over time, you know, I think what happens with us with, with any difficult emotions outside of grief is that as we feel a wave of difficult emotions start to come up, our, our first kind of automatic reaction is to get off of it. But if we were out in the ocean, we just tried to get off a wave, right? That another one's going to come and we're going to be out there drowning in this, like, I can't experience this. And, and listen, I don't like to experience pain either. Don't let me, don't, don't, don't let me, don't let me try to get across it. Like I, I'm some you know, monk that's not going to experience any pain. That's just not part of life, right? You're going to, it's part, it's part of what happens. But I think that the solution to this, if we're looking at it as from a, a very practical way is to learn how to like ride that wave as it comes up and then let it kind of settle down. And, and maybe over time, even learning to surf those waves, yeah. like not, not to like enjoy it, but know that, you know, this, you know, as, as the saying goes, this too shall pass, right? This too shall pass, by the way, also applies to good feelings. You know, right? every time I'm feeling great, you know, I'm going to feel bad at some point. And when I'm feeling bad, I, I'll feel better at some point. There, these emotions run through us. But rather than try to avoid that emotion or, you know, talk ourselves, you know, out of experiencing it or find ways to get our, out of experience, whether that's, you know, substances or people or other processes or whatever it is to really be able to experience it. That's what, I mean, I think that's what great therapy is, is, is being with somebody to help witness you move through the painful stuff. You know, cause we need to move through it, not around it, not above it, not under it, kind of, kind of, kind of through it. And, and I think that's coming back. I, I don't know if I answered the question fully with, you know, with how to deal with kids with this. You know, I, I, I don't want to put things in my kids' lives that put them in danger, but I don't know what her experience about this is going to be later on. It might just be that I learned a lot from it with her. Um, but, you know, maybe it will be something where she meets death in a different way. Maybe it, it has her meet her own death in a certain way. Maybe it helps me do that, right? Because that's coming. It's coming. And, 
And probably any anxieties that I have, you know, if we trace or anybody has, if we trace them out, are death anxiety. I might not be thinking because something didn't go my way today at work that I'm going to die. But if I really trace that out, that sense of worry about something that might be really small really gets big enough that it might be like death. So, you know, going to the kids, it's like, you know, finding ways to be with your kids so they can experience that stuff. Because what's really happening when I don't want my kid to experience pain is I don't want to experience, what's really happening is I don't want to experience the pain of my kid experiencing pain. Yeah. So it's about me. Yeah. You know, and so when they, and then when they do experience trauma like that is, is being with them in a way that they, they can fully experience it. And you know, that might mean they need help. That might mean that I, they need help outside of what I can offer or another parent can offer. And just knowing that we can't, um, Peter Levine again wrote a book called Trauma Proofing Your Kids. Like, and I think the point of it is we can't really trauma proof them, but we can, as Dan Siegel says, optimal parenting is not, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but it's like not perfect parenting. It's when there's a rupture, there's a repair. Like not if there's a rupture in the relationship, not if you make mistakes, not if they get hurt, when, how is it repaired? Mm. And, um, I think that can work with our, with ourselves too, is like not holding ourselves in a way that we're never going to experience pain, that we're never going to fall short, that we're never going to fall down. But when we do, you know, really allowing ourselves to, you know, again, fully experience it, which is a longer conversation, I think about what that means for each individual. I don't want to just sound so esoteric, like you just feel it and it goes away, but it's how do we lean into that and learning how to do that with, with, with often the help of others. You know, you, you beat me to the punch in regards to mentioning uh, the, the waves and that analogy, but you know what I think this life shit is? is when, you, when you're in a riptide or a strong current, the natural instinct is to, is to try to swim out of it, swim against it, try to swim out of it, but the current's going to take you wherever it is, and they always say when you're in a strong riptide to let it take you where it's got to go, and it's going to take you to shore. And as corny, as corny as that is, I feel like that's life in so many ways. I don't know if it's Taoist or what, or just learning from a riptide. It's, I feel like we just got to let it take us and it makes it come out as a way that we have no control, but I don't think that's true because we have the control to respond to that current and that's control in itself. But at the end of the day with this life stuff, it's like, I think if the current gets you, you got to just, you got to lean back and let the current take you where it's going to take you. And in the specific realistic aspect of a current, it's going to take you to shore. And I truly believe that. And I think if you allow yourself to go through it, you allow yourself to release it in a way, even though you're in it, it's going to take you back where you need to be at whatever that place is, maybe a different orbit, maybe a different shoreline and maybe a different beach, but you're, you're, you're back to land. And I don't know whatever non corny way to say that, but to me, I think that's how I want to ride through life because it's like, it's a, it's a, 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 a surrender. And I'm still learning that. That's another thing I don't know if you have opinions on, but the idea of surrender, it's hard for me to grasp, but I get it. And I sometimes want to release. I feel like I have so much shit to surrender, whether it's this podcast and surrendering where it's going to be, even though I believe it and have faith, blah, 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 or whatever we're going through. It's that the idea of truly letting go, I feel like is real freedom. But at the same time of knowing that, I don't even know what the hell that means. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'd be, I, I, I don't think I know exactly what it means either. And I think that's a, that's, that's a beautiful part of it. Cause we get to keep, keep seeking and discovering, but you know, surrender might mean things, to, different things to different people, you know, that you're kind of, some people will think it means giving up, but, you know, or when you hear the term powerless, it's like that it's taking, it's meaning weakness. I actually think those things are great strength. Because if I, if I can know what I can, where I can exert my own will or my own power, like I know now I'm out of the rip current so I can actually swim, that's great. But if I'm in the, or I swim at an angle to get to shore, you know, if I don't do that, I'm going to just drown. But if conversely, I decide to exert my will using your example in the current, I'm going to tire myself out and drown before I can get to the place where I can swim. So where do you surrender? doesn't mean you've given up. It actually means you've said, this way isn't working. I'm going to let it take me where it goes. And I'm going to, you know, do the footwork when the footwork's necessary. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, that, and, and letting go doesn't mean that, you know, people will come to me and they'll say, I let go of that. And now it's back. Like, what do I do? And like, I, I just always say, letting go doesn't mean it's gone. Mm -hmm. 
It just means you don't have a grip on it and it doesn't have a grip on you. And to fully accept something doesn't mean you like it either. You know what I mean? It's like you might still not dislike it, but like where can I exert, you know, where do I have the ability to, to make change? Where do I not? Yeah. It's like that, uh, or the serenity prayer. It's kind of like let it's just yeah. accepting with things you can't change and being okay with the things you can't. It's uh, it, no, it's the, accepting the things you. It's <laughs> granting me the serenity. You accept the things like I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, which often means facing risk and doing things that are uncomfortable for me. And then the kicker is the wisdom to know the difference. Yep. And that's where we often need help. Where it's like I, you know, it, this the way that I'm pushing into this isn't going to work anymore. I'm going to get exhausted. Yeah. It's like knowing what, it's knowing when to do and when not to do, and sometimes you just got to be and not do anything. I think I'm reading. I think yeah. I'm reading the Dao, uh, the Tao Te Ching too much because that's what's coming out right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that, that's great. There's a uh, a teacher I had that, I, and I, he may have been quoting somebody else, but I heard him say once that there's a the most spiritual song he ever heard was a song that went, "Row, row, row your boat." gently down the stream row 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 your boat life is but a dream you know just to to row gently and let the current do what it can and you know if you need to get off onto shore you paddle diagonally and get off and you know don't fight upstream all the time Mm. and and i think that's where surrender comes in recognizing when i'm swimming upstream and it's not getting me where i want to go and then there's that you know and 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 maybe it can take me to where to where I need. I, I think your example of, of the the rip current is 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 a great one. I mean, if you you go, I live near the beach. If you go to the beach, they'll they they show those how the rip currents you know kind of will spit you out. But you know, most of the drownings that happen off the beach here happen in about three feet of water because people get pulled out by those rip currents. You know, they're waiting in the water, and then they get pulled out by these currents, and then they try to swim against them, and they get tired, and they and they drown. Yeah, I really feel like there's um, <clears throat> there's just a current to life. I don't know what the heck it is. I don't know what you want to call it, but I just like I always feel like there's just this invisible current that is just happening, and we're just here for the ride, and you can't fight it, and you just can't fight. It. That's why it goes back to grief not being linear. Life is not linear. Nothing is linear. It's like you gotta you gotta zoom out. Whether it's success, whatever pattern, it's, it's, it's just a constant up and down, and it's finding that that peace within the chaos, whatever that means. And I think it's just an acceptance. I think it's a letting go of. I think expectations are a big thing too. It's like a balancing act of having goals and faith, but also letting go of expectations in anything we do. Um, I'm not, I'm not that I'm demonizing expectations, but kind of, <laughs> I think I got once, once I have less expectations, like it's, I don't know. It's just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to sit out to this. I have faith, but I, whatever happens, happens. I, I agree with you that life is not linear, but there is a component of life that's, that's very linear and it's the, the construct of time, mm. you know? And I think when we get so attached to time, is when it creates the anxieties and depression. It's one of the components that, that create it. You know, I'm thinking about when I'm going to die or when I'm not, or, you know, when this needs to get done or when that needs to get done. And there's actually a, a, a yogic prayer I like called the Asatoma prayer. And I'm not going to, there's different translations, but the one I like is, you know, it says to please allow me to lead this practice from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, and from time bound consciousness to the timeless state of being that we are. Mm-hmm that timeless state of being more like a a spiritual relationship with the self, right? Like it's kind of this vertical alignment of what's most important to me and not being connected to so much to, you know, what, what the stories I'm telling myself about, you know, my age, how, how much time I have, how much time I don't have. And when we can, you know, kind of get into that, what not to get too spiritual, but that kind of more vertical alignment, you know, that life is a series of moments and I can live in this moment without fighting of, uh, you know, without being in conflict with what happened la- the last moment and what's happening next. And that doesn't mean that we don't think about the future or plan for it, but there's a way in which we can navigate the world and, you know, not allow us to create the anxieties over something that might have happened 20 years ago or something that might happen in 20 years or 20 months or 20 minutes. Um, mm. And I think that's a, there's kind of a, if you've ever sailed a little boat, like a little uh, sailboat, you know, there's different points of sail. And if you pull in the, the sail really tight, the winds, if the sail is going to be harder, the wind's going to catch it and it's going to move faster, right? If the wind's running slow, you put out more sail and it catches it. You might move slower, but it's going to, it's going to catch it and move you. But the thing is, if you, if you pull that sail in too tight, 
it's not going to catch the wind in the way that it moves you, but you're going to spin around. And if you let it out too much, it's not going to catch any wind and you're not going to move at all. And I think that, you know, kind of focus on everything that's happening, pulling life in so tight and that, that thing spinning around, that's like anxiety. And letting it go where you're not interacting with life and there's, there's no wind moving you, that's like depression. It doesn't mean that's the diagnosis that you have, but I'm just saying that's like those symptoms. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to kind of practice life in which, you know, I, I, like using these points of sale to recognize what's going on, using those things like the serenity prayer to say, hey, this is when I need to pull in tight. This is when I need to let go. This is when we need to sit still. This is when we need to move. Yep. It's that yin and yang. Oh. Well, yeah, let's not get, let's not get too... Uh, <laughs> yes, it's not yin it was like Jesus once said. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, Are you name dropping? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have, I go way back. With was he on the podcast? Uh, I, I go way back with JC, but he hasn't been willing to uh, accept my invitation. So we'll see what happens after this. Okay. Put have, in a good word. Probably doesn't have Google. Doesn't have Google Chrome. <laughs> no, he has Google Cross. Um, so Ryan, I want to thank you for being on here. And one thing I do want to drop in now, because I'm, uh, I, I'm, I feel like this could be another conversation. Uh, I feel like we can keep going on and maybe tap other subjects. If you are listening right now, I want you to let me know if you have any specific questions or topics that maybe Ryan can be a part of down the line. This is also me baiting him to coming back on the show. So in the meantime, if you do have any questions or topics that you maybe want Ryan to um, – Discuss. Let me know because I think like there's a whole laundry list of things we could have gone on on, and I really appreciate your insight. I think you're brilliant, and um, I, you. I really appreciate your time. I can tell just from talking to you that your work is probably incredible. So, um, I, I and you're on the short list of people that want me back. Okay. So it's really great. I, I really, I really <laughs> there we go. Maybe I'll see you in Boca Raton or whatever the the Del Rey That'd something that you said. Um, but regardless, uh, I want to thank you for being on here again. And if there's anything you want to mention about yourself or people how to find you. I'm going to drop the links in the description if you want to find them, of course. But if there's anything you want to plug in, uh, feel free to take this time. No, I just want to th say, take a moment to say thank you. I, I love what you're doing. I think this is a really important topic. I think what you're doing is what I was sharing that how my daughter experienced it, right? Really not normalizing it in a way that it, it's going to feel great, but knowing that, hey, this is something we're going to deal with. And, 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 I think people really learn, I know people really learn through the stories of others and how they can relate and, you know, finding healing themselves. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big, you know, uh, while people need, I, I think often need help from others, it's great to be able to find ways for people to help themselves. And even if that's getting to a place where they, they need to ask for help, right? And um, so I'm, I'm appreciative of, of you being here and doing what you do and having me on to talk with you. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. And hopefully we'll see you again on the show. And for everyone else listening, I appreciate you guys tuning in. And until another time, as always, episodes drop on Mondays. Come back, blah, blah, blah. See you later. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.